Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College and we're going to continue with the introduction to anatomy and physiology and this time we're going to focus on the two major mechanisms by which our body maintains homeostasis. These are the positive and negative feedback mechanisms. We're finally getting to the meat of this presentation and that is homeostasis. Homeostasis is a word you've been introduced to pretty much since day one in your biology classes and you've learned that it has something to do with equilibrium uh, in the body. We really need to go into much more depth on what homeostasis really refers to or what it really means. So let's take a look at its definition that was introduced by a physiologist by the name of Walter Cannon. And he stated that, and I'm going to underline a few things here, that homeostasis is not just an equilibrium. It's a dynamic state of equilibrium in which internal conditions vary. But when they vary, they do that within relatively narrow ranges. And this is going to require a lot of communication between the various cells, organ systems of the body. So let's kind of analyze what he's really talking about here. And um, if we just take a quick look, and I've given, I've created another video about this um, as well on CNM Glass, so you can watch that video to get more details. But let's say we were to record your blood pressure all day long. Your blood pressure is not going to, if we were to plot the data of your blood pressure, it's not going to look like a straight line. On the other hand, uh, or I should say quite the opposite, your blood pressure is going to be more like this. Perhaps you had to run to your car here, maybe you sat around for a while, etc. On average, it's probably going to be right here. So this is more the number that we tend to focus on when we look at homeostatic numbers, whether it's blood pressure or temperature or heart rate. But we have to keep in mind that really our body is constantly in flux. In other words, we see that homeostasis is a dynamic state. It's constantly changing of equilibrium and it can do that by creating these changes on the inside of our body, but all of these changes stay within relatively narrow ranges. If we go outside of these ranges, let's say that this is our range here and this is our range there, if we were to go beyond them, that would be meaning that we're either sick, possibly dying, uh, basically, our life is, is possibly in danger or we're certainly not healthy at that point. Now, when we look at the homeostatic control mechanisms <clears throat> excuse me, in the body, <clears throat> which we have illustrated here in a little flow chart, we see that there are some major components that make up a homeostatic control mechanism. This is the mechanism that will maintain homeostasis in the body. First of all, we're going to have a sensor, or often, I will more often refer to this as the receptor. And its responsibility is to uh, detect a stimulus. And what is a stimulus? A stimulus is defined as a change in the environment. Now, the environment is going to be the environment either outside of our body, perhaps the temperature around us changes, perhaps uh, there's cologne that we're now smelling, uh, perhaps um, we detect somebody touching us, but it could also be a change inside of our body. For instance, when you eat food and the stomach wall stretches, that stretching is a stretch stimulus that should be that will be picked up by receptors in the walls of your stomach. I guess your stomach only has one wall, so in the wall of your stomach. So these receptors are responsible for picking up changes in the environment. They're going to then relay that information 
to what we refer to as our control center. And very often the control center is going to be um, our, our central nervous system. So I'll put our CNS, which includes the brain and the spinal cord, but not always. It can also be part of the endocrine system. It can be a major gland. So I'm going to put endocrine there. I hope you can read that. Um, so it could be a gland instead of our brain or spinal cord. But basically our control system, our homeostatic control system, is going to be the area that receives the information from the receptors. And it's going to interpret that information, make sense out of it. And then it's going to send out commands to the effectors. So I'll put here commands. It's a little hard for me to write here with my stylus, and these commands are then reached, um, or then reach what we call effectors. Now effectors are going to include all of our muscles, and I'm not just talking the muscles that you use to move your skeleton, I'm talking about your heart muscle, I'm talking about the muscles that cause your um, inner organs, your viscera to move, which is which includes your stomach, which includes your intestines, your bladder, your, your, the uterus if you have one. So all of the muscles, not just skeletal muscles, but also cardiac muscle, also smooth muscle, and all of the glands in our body. And again, not just glands that make hormones, which are the glands that belong to the endocrine system, but glands that secrete saliva, that secrete sweat, that secrete mucus which are glands that do not belong to the endocrine system. And so these effectors carry out the commands that the control centers send out, or the control center. And when these effectors do that, it is going to impact our whole body, usually by restoring homeostasis, sometimes not. So let's take a look at this. Our body might depend on either negative feedback mechanisms or positive feedback mechanisms. It all depends on what the needs are. Most often, we depend on negative feedback mechanisms. Down here, once again, you see the homeostatic control mechanism that I just described to you in the previous slide. And we're now going to see how a negative feedback mechanism follows this flow chart that explains our homeostatic control mechanism to return the body to homeostatic conditions. So negative feedback is used or is tapped into by the body when the body is slowly but surely moving away from homeostasis, from homeostatic conditions. Think, for instance, of how your thermostat works. Your thermostat detects when the temperature is perhaps dropping in your house below a particular range. Remember that, the definition of homeostasis. And if it drops below that range, it's going to try to fix it. And the way that it does that is by detecting that drop in temperature, triggering a mechanism that now turns on the heat. The heat kicks in and slowly but surely, the temperature in the house rises back to where you want it to be, back to, let's just refer to that as the homeostatic conditions. Our body works very similarly. We're going to, in this slide, take a brief look at how our body thermoregulates with the help of a process we call sweating. There's different forms in which we thermoregulate, meaning how we regulate our body temperature. But sweating is one of them. And then in the next slides, we'll look at how we regulate our glucose levels in the blood. So, Notice this, the chart on the right-hand side, which represents how we use sweating to thermoregulate and how it very much follows the flow chart that we learned about already. So let's say that we sit in a classroom where it's quite balmy and our body temperature therefore starts to exceed um, its homeostatic levels.
Our body temperature on average, as it shows here, is 37 degrees Celsius. So we'll just use Celsius here for a while rather than Fahrenheit. So our body temperature is rising. This is going to be detected then by nerve cells, or we refer to nerve cells also as neurons, in the skin and the brain, and they are actually our sensory receptors. So perhaps I should just say that these are sensory receptors um, in the skin, and then these receptors send that signal um, to the uh, control center uh, in the brain, which is our temperature regulation control system in the brain. That particular part of our brain then sends out the commands, commands that will trigger effectors to fix the problem. And the obvious effectors are going to be our sweat glands. So they're now going to start sweating, and sweating, when it evaporates, takes with it the heat from our skin, and that's going to begin to cool us off. So sweating is very much uh, going to work like your evaporative cooler in your house in the summer. And as we cool off, we're going to bring our body temperature down. So the body temperature begins to drop, and therefore we're back to um, 37 degrees Celsius. And so we've gone from being above 37 degrees Celsius to being back to 37 degrees Celsius. The point I'm making here is that in a negative feedback mechanism, we're going to see that the response by our effectors will be such that it's going to counteract what the original stimulus was. So in the case of the original stimulus, we saw that uh, our body temperature was rising. What is the impact of our sweat glands? What is the impact of the effectors here? Our body temperature starts to drop back to where we want it to go to. Therefore, the term negative feedback. The negative feedback, the term negative refers to the opposite effect that the effectors have on the original stimulus. Let's take a look now at how a negative feedback mechanism uh, applies to uh, regulation of glucose in our blood. It is very, very crucial, as I think all of you know by now, that glucose levels are kept within narrow ranges in our bloodstream because glucose is such an important fuel molecule for our cells. As a, as, a, you know, as a matter of fact, you've learned this, glucose is, a, is the molecule that our cells depend on um, a lot, not, primar not only, but a lot for the production of ATP in cellular respiration. So all of our cells need to have access to glucose, but we can't have too much in our bloodstream or too little in our bloodstream, and so we have this negative feedback mechanism that keeps the glucose within a particular range. Now let's say that you got up this morning and I had too many um, very sweet rolls or very sweet donuts, and therefore we're going to start suffering briefly, if everything works right in your body, of a condition we call hyper glycemia and what this literally means if you analyze this and this is what I will often do for you in this class is analyze all of these Greek and Latin based words hyper of course means more glyc or glyco always refers to sugars or sugar or glucose and emia always refers to blood so it's too much sugar in our blood so here we're going to start, I'll circle our starting point, and the starting point here is uh, labeled as homeostasis. So our goal is to be right around 90 milligrams per deciliter of blood. It's not really that crucial for you to memorize this number, that is not the point. Just bear in mind that our goal is to go back to homeostatic conditions. So you ate a bunch of donuts right here, and now you're hyperglycemic. You have too much glucose in the bloodstream. Well, how can the body deal with that? 
Well, the obvious solution would be to remove the excess glucose, and that's in indeed what will happen, but we need some help uh, for this to happen. And this is where your pancreas kicks in. So the pancreas is a very important gland in the body that functions as an endocrine gland because it produces two important hormones, and one of those is insulin. We will talk about insulin here in this scenario. Um, it produces another hormone. We'll get to that next. But the pancreas plays another role. It is a very important digestive system structure in the sense that it produces enzymes for digestion. But that is not the focus of the pancreas here. The pancreas here plays a role in secreting insulin because with the help of insulin now, the cells in the body will be able to absorb the glucose that's flowing around in the blood. So here's our pancreas right here. It has these special cells that produce insulin and that insulin will then make it into the bloodstream. By definition, a hormone will go straight into the bloodstream via an important artery here that manages to take the blood to eventually to the various cells throughout the body. And insulin has several impacts. For one, it'll help the cells to pick up, for the, for the cells to pick up the glucose so that they can go with the help of your mitochondria, primarily go through cellular respiration and make ATP, right? So we can make ATP or the cells can make ATP in order or as they pick up the glucose. But if the cells have more than enough glucose and there's still extra glucose in the blood, we can make sure that no extra glucose is produced. In other words, we're going to make sure that whatever glucose products that are stored somewhere are not going to be broken down so that more glucose is released. So we see that we're going to prevent the breaking down of glycogen and instead make glycogen. And I wish your book would actually even use the term for the producing of glycogen, but let's just leave it at this. So we're making glycogen. And what is glycogen? Glycogen is just glucose after glucose after glucose. So I put a little N here to imply that that is what glycogen is. So glycogen is many glucose molecules stuck together. And glycogen can be stored in the liver and even in our muscles to some extent, and that is our skeletal muscles in particular. So we're going to prevent the breaking down of glycogen, but we're going to promote the making of glycogen. So we can store all of that glucose. And we're also going to prevent the making of new glucose from things such as amino acids and glycerol. Um, and that's where we use the term gluconeogenesis, gluco referring to glucose again, neo meaning new, and genesis make meaning the making, the creation of. And this all makes sense. So if we allow for cells to pick up the ex extra glucose, if we allow for the liver and skeletal muscles to store glucose and we make sure that glycogen is not broken down, but instead it's made, and we prevent the cells from making new glucose from things such as amino acids, for instance, we're going to definitely bring down our glucose levels in the blood and therefore eventually we go back to homeostatic levels. So the point that you need to see here is that we initiated the whole process because we had too much glucose, or maybe I should not say too much. I should say, let's erase that. Let's say that, let's just use arrows, and let's say that we had an increased level of glucose, and our response is that we are going to see a decrease in glucose back to homeostatic levels. So notice the opposite directions of these two arrows that I just drew 
this is what makes this, this right here is what makes this a negative feedback mechanism. So let's look at the next scenario. Let's say we don't have enough glucose in the body. That's the next slide. In hypoglycemia, where we do not have enough glucose in the blood, perhaps you didn't, you had to skip a meal because you had to go to class. We're going to now see a very similar reaction in the body. Once again, we will see that it's the pancreas that gets involved, but this time it releases glucagon. So it's a different hormone. So this time we re release something called glucagon. Please don't confuse this with glycogen. Glucagon is a hormone. So the pancreas produces insulin when there's too much sugar in the blood and it'll produce glucagon when there isn't enough glucose in the bloodstream, when we are hypoglycemic. And it's going to trigger all of the things that, all of the opposite things that insulin did. So this time we're going to prevent the cells from uh, picking up any more sugar, or I should say glucose from the bloodstream. So no ATP synthesis, so no ATP production because that requires glucose. We are now going to break down the stored glycogen. So this time, yes, we want to break down glycogen by means of glycogenolysis, and we want to make new glucose molecules from amino acids and free glycerol molecules. And we call that gluconeogenesis because that will then bring up our uh, glucose levels. So notice that we our initial trigger is such that we have a drop in glucose levels in the bloodstream and our response is that we see a, an increase in glucose in the bloodstream. Once again, notice the opposite direction of the arrows. By the way, didn't mention this in the previous slide, but where are the receptors? Where's the control center? Where is the effector in this scenario? Well, this is glucose regulation is kind of a, um, a, a crazy situation in the sense that really our pancreas, the gland, the pancreas serves all three roles. In the pancreas, there are receptors that detect either the drop or the rise in glucose levels in the blood. So the receptors are in the pancreas. Secondly, we also see that the pancreas can interpret the levels of the glucose, blood, uh, the glucose in the blood. So we see that it functions as a control center and it also functions as the effector because it actually produces and secretes the hormones that will ultimately bring our glucose levels back to homeostatic conditions. Now, this homeostatic control mechanism that we visited a couple of slides ago also depends on positive feedback mechanisms. The negative feedback mechanisms our bodies depend on to restore homeostasis. But believe it or not, sometimes a mechanism kicks in called a positive feedback mechanism that pushes our bodies further and further away from homeostasis. You might wonder why. Well, sometimes our bodies need to do that in order for something short term to happen. In other words, these processes are not common in the body, these positive, positive feedback processes because they have to be short term. Because if they were to go on too long, obviously we would go way beyond our homeostatic ranges that our body can accept and deal with, and we would literally die. So there are a couple of, of really, or a few of really good examples of positive feedback. And as the semester goes on, you'll be introduced to some more of them. You'll begin to recognize others.
um, childbirth, which I have depicted here, is an example, but also uh, blood clotting and what happens just prior to blood clotting, which is where the platelets in your blood vessels that are damaged, let's say you cut yourself, will form a plug. And you learn in AMP2 that first the platelet plug forms and then the process of blood clotting kicks in. But both of those are definitely examples of positive feedback. And you may need to read certainly about um, platelet plug formation. You may want to look it up Look, at, read a little bit about it perhaps in your book or Wikipedia so that you understand how it works as a positive feedback mechanism. I'm going to introduce you here to childbirth. So let's say that, well, first of all, here we have our baby in the uterus and clearly the baby needs to be born through the vagina, but the connection between the vagina and the uterus is referred to as the cervix, which you see spelled right here. So when the baby is getting ready to be born, it literally starts to push against the cervix. In the cervix are receptors, and these receptors are going to communicate with the help of nerve cells, communicate the stimuli from the baby to the brain. So the brain is going to be our control center. As a matter of fact, in the brain we have a gland that can interpret the information which we call the pituitary gland and what it does is it is going to be, it's going to secrete um, oxytocin, a hormone. So we have in a sense really two control centers. We have the brain which receives the signals from the receptors and then we have our endocrine gland, the pituitary gland, which is going to release a hormone oxytocin, and that is going to impact the effectors. The effectors being the smooth muscle of the uterus. So when oxytocin, which is a hormone, makes it into the bloodstream, eventually it'll reach the uterus. And in the uterus are smooth muscle cells that will now be stimulated to contract. So the baby is starting to be squeezed by the smooth muscle of the uterus and consequently it now is going to get pushed even harder up against the cervix. And this then translates in the cervix sending even more signals to the brain, more oxytocin is released, more contraction of the uterus, more pushing of the baby, more signals from the brain, more oxytocin, and so on. And this continues until the baby is born. But let's stop for a moment and let's not, um, let's say the baby is not born yet and we're continuing this process. Let's take a look at what happens. So here we see that the stimulus is the baby pushing more and more. I'll just put more pushing of the brain, of not the brain, the baby against the cervix. So that's our initial stimulus. Let's now take a look at what the response is. And the response is that there is more pushing again. So what I'm trying to convey to you here is that in a positive feedback mechanism, the response of the effectors, which are the smooth muscles of the uterus, is such that it's going to exacerbate the initial stimulus. The initial stimulus was the pushing of the baby against the cervix. The response is going to cause even more pushing of the baby and even more and even more. So we're seeing that the initial stimulus is actually increased or augmented. You can think of it that way. So the response goes in the same direction as the original stimulus. Now you can see that this cannot go on forever clearly. Therefore, um, once the baby is born, this whole mechanism stops immediately, or pretty much immediately. If this were to keep going, this would become a problem. Similar principle with blood clotting. You wouldn't want, after a vessel is damaged because you cut yourself, for the clotting to keep going on and keep going on. 
uh, that would be dangerous. It would be dangerous to have a bigger and bigger clot in our bloodstream. So positive feedback mechanisms, despite the fact that they depend on a cascade mechanism, must be short-lived, otherwise they become life-threatening and can kill us.